Welcome, everybody. It's a, an intimate group today, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, uh, this is the diversity and inclusion uh, session, Barriers to Diversity and Leadership. I'm hoping for a really good discussion given the, the size of the audience. Uh, Jim and I were having a conversation yesterday about how to um, how to affect change and how to bring people along uh, in during the change process. And what uh, came up out of that is uh, the term co-create, to co-create the solution. Um, part of co-creation means actively participating, not uh, just listening to whoever's uh, standing up here talk. So we're hoping to engage everyone in the conversation. Our first speaker today is uh, uh, Dr. Jim Rawson, who, uh, Okay, Dr. Carla Sepulveda, <laughs> assistant professor, who is going to uh, be reviewing the literature. Thanks, Carla. This is the size of group that I love to speak to when we get it uh, small and intimate. It, you know, when we talk about barriers to diversity and leadership, I think it is a more personal conversation that a lot of people in leadership struggle with. And so actually this crowd that's here is actually kind of a nice representation of productive conversations that we can have. I want to thank Dr. Rawson for inviting me to speak on this very important topic. Uh, I'm one of the faculty at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. When we look at diversity and the literature on diversity, really the most common groups that are discussed are women, underrepresented racial minorities, and uh, sexual orientation for our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual colleagues. In the radiology literature, really the preponderance of the literature is on women, uh, we're having increasing literature on underrepresented minorities, but given the 20 minute time frame I've been allowed and given that there's more literature on women, I wanna focus on that topic. I'm gonna to look at three barriers that have been defined in the literature. First, pipeline. Second, second generation gender bias. And third, work family balance. So let's look at the numbers in radiology. This is a recent article from the AJR. And if we look, uh, this was an article where they looked at 51 different academic programs across the country. And in terms of numbers for just the faculty, uh, you'll see that about a third of women uh, comprise women faculty in academic radiology. When we move to the vice chair and section chiefs, we see that that changes to men being three times more likely to hold those positions than their woman colleagues. And then when we go to the chair position, you can see that it's actually a 10 to one ratio, where for every 10 men that are chairs, there is one female chair. When I look at these numbers, I can't help but wonder what the mother of our field, Marie Curie, would think about this. So let's look at the first barrier that we've defined, pipeline. In radiology, which is the ninth largest ACGME training specialty, we rank 17th for representation of women among the 20 largest training programs. And really, in fact, it's the lowest ranked of the non-surgical specialties. Unfortunately, this is somewhat of a chronic issue. Uh, we see that there's been stagnant growth of female radiology residents over the past two decades, and that we hover somewhere just above 25% of radiology residency spots being filled by females. You know, it's logical that if we have fewer women going into radiology, that this really limits the number of women available for future leadership positions. So in the literature, we see a lot of exploration of what are the motivating factors that lead women to choose radiology as a field. 
that those reasons underline the gender disparity in the radiology training programs. And this was a recent article uh, from the JACR. And you see here that a very common trend in these articles is this concept of the perception of a lack of direct patient contact being important. But if we look more closely, and something that I appreciate, I'm sorry, I hope this projects okay for you, um, in this bar graph where they look at the top factors deterring medical students from radiology, really that, that perception of the lack of patient contact is shared by both men and women. And the women here are represented in purple and the men in blue. But what is statistically di uh, different between men and women is this idea that women medical students think that they need to have more physics knowledge to go into radiology. And I think this almost goes back to that whole conversation of trying to increase women in the STEM sciences that goes back to elementary school education. Another article for the pipeline looked at factors that influence fourth year medical students to choose radiology. And this first column is for women and the second column for men. And the three most frequently cited reasons for women choosing radiology was the feeling that they, that impact on patient care that they believed radiology has. Second, the intellectual challenge of our field. And third, that they had a role model. And really I wanted to include that because I think as leaders in our field, we need to think of really encouraging our female faculty to take an active role in medical student education so that they can provide that role model for prospective medical students coming into our field. The second barrier to uh, diversity in radiology leadership uh, that we'll discuss is second generation gender bias. And this was something that was covered in uh, an article by the Harvard Business Review uh, in 2013. And what they say is research is really moving away from a focus on the deliberate or overt exclusion of women that they say really a lot of people think got eliminated with the civil rights movements in the 60s to a second generation form of gender bias as the primary cause of women's persistent underrepresentation in leadership roles. How they describe this in the article is that it's powerful but subtle, often invisible barriers for women that arise from cultural assumptions and organizational structures, practices, and patterns of interaction that inadvertently benefit men. <clears throat> and although there's a lack of clear intent to be discriminatory, this gender bias can obstruct development of leadership identity in women. And three factors that they talk about in the article are a paucity of role models for women. Second, women's lack of access to networks or sponsors. And something that they call double binds. And we'll look at each of these uh, independently in the next uh, slides. So role models. Aspiring leaders need role models whose styles and behaviors they can experiment with. And I love that she's here in the room. <laughs> I didn't know you'd be here, but these can be very personal or local, um, such as Susan John, which many of you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, when I was in residency, she was named as chairman of our department, and I've subsequently had uh, the benefit of interacting with her on the state level for um, organized radiology. But not only on a local level, sometimes role models can be people that we don't even interact with. And as I was a resident, again, Dr. Vitterini and Dr. Jackson served back-to-back -back roles as ACR presidents. And although I didn't have direct interaction with these ladies, certainly for junior women in the field, seeing these ladies in these power positions gives us the idea that we have access and have a place in the leadership circles. Next, we'll discuss lack of access to networks and sponsors. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Informal networks are precious resources for would-be leaders. In the article, they say that differences in men's and women's organizational roles and career prospects result in weaker networks for women. <clears throat> There's also this human tendency to gravitate to people like oneself. Again, this is very subtle. You know, it almost speaks to uh, the concept of unconscious bias that we hear so frequently in these conversations. This leads men in positions of power to mentor, <coughs> excuse me, and advocate for other men who whose leadership position, when leadership positions arise, um, and to direct developmental opportunities to junior men. So I want to take a minute to talk about mentors because we know this is really critically important. Um, you know, mentors advise junior faculty on the importance of key activities for promotion. They introduce junior faculty to hospital leaders and important committee positions. And I think this importance of mentors is what led Madeleine Albright to say, you know what, there's a special place for these ladies that don't help other women, to really encourage those female mentorship bonds. When I look at my own CV, and I look at what are the components of my CV that are likely to help me get promoted, interestingly, I have all men to thank for those opportunities. And I, I bring this up in part um, to, for, for the men in the room that are in leadership positions to really consider your junior faculty women. I think this is less a matter of discrimination and more a matter of who holds the power positions in radiology. And by the numbers, as we saw earlier in this talk, it's generally men. Um, so in a grateful uh, comment to these gentlemen who've all approached me with opportunities that have really helped my career, I want to likewise encourage the men in the room to do that for other junior women. Next, I want to uh, discuss the idea of the double bind that's discussed in this article. And I want to walk you through the concept because I think this is real. Uh, first, in most cultures, masculinity and leadership are closely linked those character traits of being decisive, assertive, and independent that we so associate with leadership are much more frequently associated as masculine traits. In contrast, women are expected to be nice, caretaking, and unselfish. Behaviors that suggest self-confidence or assertiveness in men are often perceived as arrogant or abrasive in women. And this mismatch between those conventionally feminine qualities and the qualities thought necessary for leadership puts female leaders in a double bind. Numerous studies have shown that women who excel in traditionally male domains are viewed as competent, but less likable than their male counterparts. And women in positions of authority who enact this more feminine style uh, may be liked, but are not respected. They're deemed too emotional to make tough decisions or too soft to be strong leaders. And really, I think this idea of double bind is what led uh, Sheryl Sandberg to do this quote, that she, you know, I want every little girl who's told she's bossy to be told and said she has leadership skills. And believe me, as the mother of a four-year-old girl, I think of this often with a, uh, a girl who's very strong-willed, but I try to remember that um, I believe this will serve her well in the future. So really, to summarize this concept of double bind, I feel that women are faced and must establish credibility in a culture that's conflicted. You know, we're conflicted about whether, when, and how women should exercise authority. And I'd like to ask the group that's here today, if you could think of one public figure that's a female that exemplifies this concept of double mind, does anyone come to mind? Exactly. And it's so funny, when I ask this of my friends, it's the same answer every time. She faces this, I think, and regardless of your politics, I believe it's something, she is a woman that engenders uh, very passionate responses in, in, in people. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
when I think of the double bind or when I have moments when I feel like perhaps I'm uh, leaning towards uh, the traditional masculine role of being more assertive, I try to remind myself of this quote, that well-behaved women uh, seldom make history. And not that I'm on a history mission, but um, certainly I think it's something that we as women leaders face. Another related topic that um, Another great female leader in our field, Carol Rumack, um, has uh, published in the uh, JACR, is this idea of women don't ask. And it's the idea that women have anxiety about negotiating or asking for promotion, for raises, for time to do the non-clinical work. And really, this anxiety um, you know, affects their potential for leadership. Uh, the explanations for why women have this anxiety can be social expectations that women will be asked rather than that they ask. And for example, in marriage, um, that women in general tend to wait for the man to ask to get married. In addition, they talk about that women tend to see control as external to themselves rather than internal. And what's interesting, if you look at the social science literature, it's, uh, you'll see that when unsuccessful in asking, men are much more likely to ask again. And just that fact of asking again increases their chances of being successful. One of, uh, an example I have of this, a personal example I have of this from our practice, we have, I have a colleague that was in private practice uh, for a large private practice group in Houston. And he was in charge of the committee for hiring for the group. And he told me that in his five years in that position, when they interviewed men, there was not a single man that did not try to negotiate the contract to their favor. And yet every single woman that they interviewed, not a single woman tried to negotiate the contract. And what was interesting is we had a fellow two years ago that he coached during her interview process and the net result was that she had a salary that was $50,000 higher and she had two additional weeks of vacation because she asked for it and was given. So this is real and important in terms of our ability to be successful. The last barrier that I'd like to discuss is work-family balance. You know, advancement in academia or in private practice requires hard work and sacrifice for both genders. And it's really why I chose the phrase work-family balance rather than work-life balance. I think both men and women struggle with a work-life balance. But I do believe that there is more of an inherent conflict of child-rearing for professional women than there are for their male colleagues. And it was discussed in this article in The Atlantic that was published in 2012. <clears throat> I put this here to remind myself, in the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, she discusses uh, an anecdote that I think is helpful to describe this. And she talks about the drop off of her children. And that when she was able to make it to drop off of her children, how relieved she felt. Because really she sees this as her duty as the mom to drop off the child. And the associated, perhaps, guilt of not making it to drop off. And yet, when her husband made it to drop off, he saw himself as a super dad. He was like, look what a great dad I am. I got my kids to drop off. And I think it exemplifies that sort of difference in what women face in a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day struggle of being professional women versus men. Another example that I wanted to discuss is the whole mommy gate of Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, and her very personal decision of when to return to work after having a child. You know, it was amazing to me that some of the most harshest critics of her decision were women. That when she said, you know what, I'm going to take two weeks off and go back to work, as the CEO of Yahoo, that other women were really critical of this decision. But I think, again, it exemplifies that inherent challenge that many women face in this balance. Promotion to the highest realms of power requires change in work-family balance and, and some compromises that we all know about 
that some women may not be willing to make. <clears throat> in Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg says 43% of highly qualified women with children are leaving their careers or off-ramping for a period of time. And we have data about this in radiology as well. This is from the 2015 uh, workforce survey that the ACR does. And I want to direct your attention here to this 35 to 45-year-old age range, which, as you know, for most uh, physicians or professional women, this is prime child-rearing years. And you can see that 68% of part-time uh, workers in this age range are female compared to 32%. What's the consequences of this? when we make this very personal decision to go part-time versus staying full-time, how does this affect our career? When we go to part-time, we see that this limits, potentially limits time for research and committee work. And interestingly, I've even heard of some of my female colleagues asking to be part-time in order to have time to do those in this atmosphere where there's less time for academic time in the academic environment, they actually choose to get less pay in order to do these activities that help to make our work more fulfilling, more than just a job. You know, we're faced with this question, you know, when we have young children, how much time can we squeeze into the early mornings before our babies get up or the late evenings after we tuck them in, or the weekends without compromising this very precious family time, or honestly, our personal sanity. If we break during child rearing years, how many years does it put us behind? You know, our female colleagues that choose to stay full time, or these male colleagues, um, we're losing time and value while these other colleagues accumulate it. So I think this is summarized in a concept that you hear in the literature of cumulative disadvantage, where the statistical effects of family and gender, whether having babies or being married, progressively leads to this diminished pipeline in terms of potential people we have for leadership in the field. So in summary, the root cause of discrepancy in leadership in radiology is multifactorial. In this conversation, we've talked about pipeline, second generation gender bias, and work family balance. By identifying these causes, we set the foundation for improvement and for really realizing the full leadership uh, potential of these faculty members. Thank you. I mean, I, you follow me, correct? Okay. Carla, thanks for taking us through uh, some really interesting literature. And if I weren't sure that this group would have fantastic ideas after the presentations, I would be just a little bit depressed right now. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Rawson uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Georgia Regents. <laughs> I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> who's going to talk about diversity and, and uh, lessons learned from other industries. <clears throat> so what Carla did nicely was to look at the radiology literature and the radiology world. What I want to do is turn the lens around and look outside of our community and see how other industries look at this and what lessons we can actually learn uh, from non-healthcare, non-academic uh, literature. Um, there, really, there really are some challenges uh, in looking at different uh, industries. And what I'm going to try and do is, is pull some examples out that we might be able to use in our own fields. And <clears throat> this is a uh, data that Lisa Abbott actually presented at the AAMC this past year in a presentation on cultural competency. And what she did is she highlighted just how diverse the U.S. population is. Uh, and from uh, the estimates for 2050, where one in five uh, in the U.S. will be Hispanic, to 20% of the U.S. actually having disabilities, 
9 million LGBT. There's, this is a very rich diversity that we have in our population, and it's one that we don't leverage successfully to a large extent. And it was the last figure that I thought was really interesting. Uh, less than 50% of employees who experience discrimination in their workplace stay. They leave. And there's a cost of them leaving. That attrition is usually 150% as, as high as double their annual salary. So the cost of replacing an employee that le has left is a significant cost. And in a workplace where people are discriminated against or don't have the same opportunities, this is a reason for turnover. So it's part of the waste and inefficiency in our system by not tapping and building all of the talent that we have in our diverse workforce. So this is uh, data actually from the UK, <clears throat> and this was looking at uh, the top 10 barriers uh, to women progressing in their careers, and very similar to what, what was highlighted in academic radiology. Uh, balancing work and family responsibilities, uh, women often seen the perception problem uh, as committed to family instead of work, their skills or abilities viewed differently, stereotyping about aspirations for promotion, lack of mentoring, very similar list to what we saw. So to me what this says is that if the similar problems are existing in other industries, there's opportunity to look at what other industries do and potentially take some of those back into our organizations. Mm -hmm. But I think you can also consolidate that list of barriers to an even shorter list and a lot of it is the economic incentive. Um, people will argue that you ca actually can't make money with diversity, that it's an obligation but it's not something that's good for business, that there's no return on investment, that it's not a competitive advantage. So I would argue that the biggest barrier um, that we really face is our own mindset. So what I'm going to look at is <clears throat> and try and convince you that these first three bullets are actually incorrect. Um, and they're incorrect by large amounts of money, which to me is stunning that, you know, in a capitalistic country, we would look at data and say there's an opportunity to make more money, and we choose not to. So this is from Catalyst, and they did a wonderful analysis of corporate boards. And it turned out that the more women board members you had, the more money the corporation made. And they divided it out on a, you know, you can get the data online, but they had multiple female members as board members, 16% more sales, 26% more return on invested capital. These are not small numbers when you think about corporate sales or corporate ROIs. This data comes from McKinsey. McKinsey publishes a report called Women Matter. It's a global study. And each year that it's updated, they actually do an analysis looking at barriers that exist in industry for women to advance. And they also look to see what industries that have been, or what corporations that have been successful are doing. And <clears throat> I'm a clumper, not a splitter, so I'll give you the big chunks. Uh, and that's the column on the left. CEO commitment, that was one of the biggest ones. If your CEO had visible evidence that they were committed to gender diversity as a focus of their leadership, then it actually had an impact. So as leaders, there's that mindset issue. Was this something we were committed to? They also had individual programs that were developing women. But again, those occur because there was a leadership commitment to that actually occurring. And they had what they called collective enablers, and these were actually policies and institutional, cultural, or infrastructure challenges that needed to be addressed. And to the extent that they addressed them, again, they were more successful. More measures implemented in order to create a more diverse workforce. Now, what was also interesting is the box on the bottom that says not statistically significant. <clears throat> these turned out to be the things we do in academics. So if you've ever been on a search committee 
and you have to have a female candidate, that actually is not statistically significant for growing a more diverse workforce. If you put on uh, leaders' evaluations that they must somehow improve diversity in their business unit, that doesn't actually translate to outcomes. So it's interesting that a number of the things that we do don't actually have as much as an impact as some of the others. This is also from uh, McKinsey's work, and they, they look at how do you create a, a, gender, a gender diverse ecosystem, and again, it begins with the, the leadership commitment. <coughs> Excuse me. And once you have that commitment at the top of an organization and have a leadership team that is now engaged in that, then sponsoring, mentoring, training, coaching, networking, all the things that Carla raised actually can occur, but occur part, as part of an organizational strategy. And then the organizational enablers, the policies and procedures that actually need to be put in place. So this is also from uh, McKinsey's work. And what they did is they looked at companies that were putting initiatives forward to have a more diverse workforce. And the column on the left, <coughs> the column on the left actually looks at the number of attempts and measures to improve gender diversity. Uh, but it's in the companies where gender diversity wasn't really on the agenda. It wasn't an identified priority. And you can see there were some attempts made. But when you look at a company where gender diversity was one of the top three priorities, you see a lot more programs put in place, and you also see impact. So for barriers, I think about the opportunities, the connections, the mentorship, again, much of what Carla presented from the, the, the radiology literature. <clears throat> so how do other industries actually try and improve gender diversity? What did they do that we're not doing? So I wanted to use two uh, examples. Uh, Celine Schillinger is someone I met through the School for Health and Care Radicals, which is an NHS group. And she actually has this marvelous story about changing the, um, the workforce and developing women in her organization. And if you want to see the whole thing, it's actually on YouTube. Um, but I'll give you the highlights of what, what she did. She wrote a detailed memo as a senior leader in her organization about the lack of opportunities for women to grow in the company she had spent her career in and why this was an underused resource for the company and that they should really take advantage of this and they should develop the women. And she sent it to the CEO and never got an answer. Um, but she also sent it to three friends and asked them their thoughts. And it turned out that the three friends shared that email with a lot of people. And it caused a conversation in the company, not a mandate from a CEO, but it caused a conversation that really became a very big conversation about gender balance. Did we have it? If we don't, do we need it? Why do we need it? And it was a conversation that was occurring in the organization that started to grow in numbers and actually ended up lunchroom conversation. Ultimately, the lunch discussions got more organized. They became more like think tanks. These were professionals who ran corporations, and they used those same skills to start to run these discussions. And this voluntary, intentional community evolved. Within six months, that community was the largest community in Sanofi Pasteur. By two years, they had 2,500 members in 50 countries. And then they started to actually build bridges to other networks. That one network started to network with other groups in other industries. The skills, the opportunity, the network that they created was more or less done without permission. It was done as a grassroots effort. And <clears throat> what was interesting, it was, it was done relatively quickly. What Celine talks about is this process they went through. <clears throat> she said that you went from not being aware of the issue, or not everyone aware of the issue, to there being an awareness, 
And then the people who were interested in it starting to talk together and building a community and actually starting to take action. So this to me looked very familiar, this continuum. It reminded me of the trans-theoretical model. This is a change management model, which essentially says there are stages and you can't skip stages. So if you aren't ready to talk about gender diversity, then the task is to get you ready. If you're getting ready, but you're not ready, then we need to get you to that point. If you actually are ready, but you don't know what to do, what actions to take, you're now looking for a list of actions. Each of these steps has very different needs, and one of the errors we often make is we assume that everybody's at the same step, so we give you the tools and you don't use them. Well, you weren't ready, you hadn't contemplated this, you hadn't decided you were gonna do something. So getting someone to work all the way through these stages in order is one of the assessments we use in change management. It's why if you look at some of our projects in academic health systems, when we implement change, we train people all the same way with the assumption they're all ready to embrace that new electronic medical record upgrade, and they all thought that was what they wanted to do that day. When the reality is probably none of them wanted to do it that day, and we didn't build and help them train and progress through this. So most of you probably have never seen this model, but it doesn't actually come from the business literature. This comes from the medical literature. This is the model for treating addiction. This is, you don't give someone the solution to manage their addiction who doesn't want a solution. You have to help them conv be, get convinced that they have a problem that they want to fix, and now they're looking for a solution. <clears throat> so it turns out, the reason I like this model is I think that we are addicted to our workplace mindset. And if we want to change that, then we actually have to go through these steps. We can't skip to the middle or to the end and just implement change. We actually have to go through this type of a process. One of the other things Celine did is she identified um, some what she considered secret sauce for her uh, changes. One was disruption. They didn't just use existing tools that they had. They used them in new ways. They created new events. They actually had events across silos in the organization. They did cross-company meetings instead of little business unit meetings. Instead of speed dating, they did speed networking. They took their brainstorming sessions they'd used for the company and they used to figure out how they could develop the team. The group was inclusive. The only criteria was you were interested in the topic, which was gender diversity. So this was men and women working together who were interested in gender diversity, an inclusive approach. And one of the things they saw was people who got engaged felt that they were stronger than they were if they were alone. They felt they were more agile because they had a giant network of people to tap into. So the innovation that I took away from her story was a lot of this was about talking to each other. Um, there's an old expression that one of the most dangerous things we can do is to introduce our friends to each other. Because once they start talking and networks form, all sorts of interesting things happen. So my link to, to Celine is I met her through the School for Health and Care Radicals that I met through a Twitter conversation for a meeting that I wasn't at. So when you think about how wide a network you can create without permission, authority, or a title, there's opportunity for us with, as leaders to actually do this in a more intentional way. So does this pay? Well, it turns out McKinsey's report estimates that it's $12 trillion that could be added to the global GDP if we advance women's, equity, women's equality. So even if McKinsey is wrong in their analysis and they say, say they're off by 50% and it's only $6 trillion, that's three times the U.S. health care budget. So next time you can't have a CT scanner that you want, there's money sitting out there that we have not realized that we could pull into our economies. And not small dollars. So the second case study, I want to give you the result and then I'll tell you about where it came from. This is a story where they earned 
a billion dollars in 20 days, 10 times faster than their next competitor. They didn't do this in an eight to five world. They actually competed with holidays and weekends and nights. And they had a smaller number of distribution sites than their competitor. So you would think of all the things that would set you up to fail, and yet one billion in 20 days. So I want to give you an exercise to think about before I tell you what, what that business model was. Uh, this is a quote from Gina Davis, and she says, when you're going through projects uh, that you're already working on, uh, this is directed towards Hollywood and screenplay writers, uh, change a bunch of the characters' first names to women's names. If a male character isn't defined by its maleness, by their maleness, then it shouldn't matter. And so she is advocating that in a character who's not defined by their gender, that you actually can change the gender or the race or other cultural aspects and create a more diverse story if that wasn't essential to their character. So this sounds very theoretical, but someone actually did that. And they made a billion dollars in 20 days. So it turned out the Star Wars movie, which many of you probably went to see, the dominant lead characters are a young woman and a man of color. And you might not have noticed that. There actually was some backlash on the Internet about changing the Star Wars characters and role models. Not a lot. And when I tell people this, some of them are actually surprised because they missed that when they saw the movie. They didn't notice that. They also didn't no notice some of the other female characters. There are a lot more female lead characters in the last Star Wars than there, are, there were in the previous ones. There was another change also that might not have been noticed, and that was the population. You would argue Star Wars is diverse. Think about all the different alien species and all the white men standing next to them. <laughs> That's diversity. So it turns out if you go back and watch the movie again, the crowd is now actually diverse, much more reflective of our population. But those subtle changes actually created role models for people for an entire generation and they made a billion dollars doing it. So <clears throat> I would argue that it's actually time to unleash the talent pool that's actually in radiology um, and that that's one of our obligations as leaders that we need to take the types of tools that are already in the literature, take the type of barriers that our own literature identifies and begin to manage those and address those in a way that actually develops and advances talent. And I think you could use the force to do that. It worked for uh, the Star Wars movie. So I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jim. Our uh, final speaker is uh, Angelisa Paladin, uh, Program Director at the University of Washington, uh, who will uh, talk about possible solutions. Yeah. Well, those are wonderful. I just have really enjoyed this morning, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, I am going to share with you a couple of things that we've done at University of Washington. Uh, and. I love that our theme is diversity and that we're starting these conversations because there's so much to learn from one another. Uh, so this, this is great. So uh, my goals are going to be to talk about the barriers and to discuss. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time on some solutions that I think um, may be helpful. So as an educator, um, I love pre-test, post-test. So we've heard some statistics this morning, so I thought we'd start. So again, so she presented. I was very shocked when I started searching the literature on this. Out of the 20 largest, I just think sometimes it's really important to emphasize that the largest uh, specialties in medicine, where we rank again. And as we learned, we are in the bottom five, right? So we, we're at 17th. Um, the other shocking statistic that I want to remind us is that out of the 20 largest specialties where we rank for underrepresented minorities, 
and last, right? So there, that is something that we really need to think about and, and process. Uh, and so it's not just a moral issue. It is, I think there's been huge amount of data that shows that diversity matters. Um, they've had eloquent studies that has showed that it enhances our communication when patients are um, meeting with people that are more like themselves culturally or uh, racially or women, um, that they have higher satisfaction uh, and there's a, they've shown that they have a higher compliance with their medications. So this matters. It's the strongest, race is the strongest predictor of serving in underserved communities. And that's one of our largest struggles right now uh, in medicine. So again, as a specialty, we need to be very uh, <laughs> cognizant of what, how we're training. And then I think it's one of the most important, as, as Jim has spoken about, is that it increases our innovation and creativity. So I think when we, we are uh, faced with this, we really need to be reflecting, like, what are we doing? And, and so I was part of a, a panel, and I witnessed uh, the CEO of Boeing came and spoke to us. And it was one of the most powerful moments in my career because he basically said, um, there's nothing you can't accomplish if you make it a priority and set it a goal. If, if, you, if it's your goal, you will do it. And so I walked away from that going, okay, as a program director, and I spoke with um, Galtham and with our chair, uh, we knew we could do better. And so uh, we set this as our goal. So let me just uh, share with you that I am in charge of the program director uh, forum, and the, uh, we did a survey, and we asked our program directors this year, do you have strategies in place to recruit? And uh, almost 65% said no. And those that did say yes, um, their answers were very similar to how, when I speak to program directors, how they feel about it, is yes, we do invite more underrepresentatives for interviews. We often um, preferentially evaluate, uh, but there was really no active action in those plans. It was more, this is what we're trying. And so uh, I wanna share with you a very personal experience. So, uh, I became program director in 2009. Um, it was a little, it was very unusual in that the program director um, died suddenly. And I uh, rose to being program director with, so as you can imagine, no mentorship at that time, had no institutional knowledge on how to recruit, okay? So I came in and my first match, this is what it was. And it was, uh, what's missing, right? Yeah. He, uh, no women. Um, white men, um, and uh, we had a couple of Asian and one Indian, men, but I was under the assumption, uh, made the false assumption that as a woman leader, women would be attracted to the program, that I didn't really need to uh, express that outwardly because we had wonderful women on faculty, uh, and I failed miserably, okay? And our faculty said, what happened? And, and I was like, you know, I'm going to do better. And so I think, so that's where I started. So I just wanted to share that with you. And then I wanted to share you, uh, with you this um, next match. And so Galtham uh, and Alvin, these are two men I want to credit. Uh, uh, Galtham came to, uh, from UCSF um, two years after I began as program director and really rose this uh, issue up with me. Like, we can do better with this. And Alvin is one of our residents now we ask every resident to contribute in some way in our residency. And so he came up to me and he said, Angelisa, I really would like to help you recruit more underrepresented minorities. I have some ideas. I think I could do a great job. And so with these men uh, help, uh, this is this year's match. I matched seven women, uh, three African-American and two Latina. Uh, and so a very, what I think we're, we are, what I want people to know is if you set a goal, you can accomplish it. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. So I'm gonna share with you some of the strategies. Uh, so we first started just with how many on your webpage, just how many uh, at your university's webpage say that diversity is important to you? Okay, great. 
So that's first just, I think, uh, a simple thing to do is we, um, one of the first sentences is we strongly value applicants who come from diverse backgrounds. And we believe this enhances the educational experience for all residents and faculty. So I think that's a, a simple thing to start with. Um, and then what we started doing is we now host a visiting student diversity program. Uh, we actually have diversity recruitment days. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about. And we have a women in radiology uh, group that gets together frequently. So I'm just going to share with you a little bit about that. So starting with the uh, visiting student diversity program. So we started this this last July. Uh, we recruit two or three medical students uh, from underrepresented areas. Uh, we have them visit our, our institution. We give them a $2,000 stipend, so there is a financial cost. Uh, we provide them uh, with housing, a list of housing, but more importantly, it's a very active process. We are looking for mentors in our upper campus and lower campus that are willing um, to host these individuals, to introduce Seattle to them. So um, the two uh, individuals in the middle were the medical students that we hosted this year, and it was, uh, they had a wonderful experience. Uh, we have them, uh, Alvin showed them around every weekend uh, in Seattle, and uh, we hosted them at all of our social events, okay? So it's a pretty active uh, process. We, in order to advertise this, right, so we, Seattle is one of the, I would say, the most statistically white states uh, besides Oregon, right? So uh, it, it, one of that barriers is, is ha introducing people to the Northwest. So we really had to advertise a lot. So we sent um, emails to all of the medical schools, diversity and student affairs. We spoke with the directors of the SNMA and Latino medical student associations. We contacted all of our radiology program coordinators, um, reached out to AMSER. So we did a lot of uh, outreach to try to get the word out. Uh, we reached, we have contacts with Meharry and Howard. Uh, we have a few students from uh, those institutions that really helped us tap into their student body. And then uh, University of Washington, we uh, sponsor a table. Uh, so how many of you have heard of the Student National Medical Association? Good for you. I'll be honest, I had never, I had not heard of it until this last year. Um, and so it is an incredible conference and a lot of individuals come and there are resources that are provided. And so one of the uh, tables we, we tried to share, we're hosting this uh, rotation, please come. And so that's how we got our applications. And we handed out our applications and our flyers for that. And we, uh, Jim, you'll be very pleased. Uh, we did a little Twitter, we tried to do Facebook. So we're trying to do active social media as well. Uh, so, and then at the end, we offer a formal interview. So they usually come in and, and uh, visit with us in July and August, and instead of having them fly back uh, because of its expense and time, uh, we, did a, we do a formal interview while they visit with us. And so uh, I was very proud. Mahogany ended up matching with us. Uh, she's an incredible individual. She's AOA, she's Gold Humanism Awards. She is the leader of her uh, chapter for uh, underrepresented minorities at her school. Uh, just incredible leadership potential. But one of the things I want you to be aware of <clears throat> is the effort is, uh, so for her husband to come, we had to find, he's a PhD student in psychology. And so Norm and I were making phone calls around campus trying to find her husband an internship. So I think, uh, and one of the things I encountered was uh, people, I would say, please, uh, would you look at this application, this CV, and would you s please give him advice? And interestingly, I was looking for a very engaged and active process, and they're like, oh, just direct them to our website. And I had to s implicitly say, please, I would really appreciate if you would speak to them personally to help them make them feel welcome. So a lot of effort, uh, but I'm really excited. Um, she's just amazing, and so she's coming. So a little bit about recruitment. Uh, again, if you think about recruitment, in order to get more underrepresented minorities and women into your faculty, the easiest way is to start with your residents and fellows, right? So you start that pipeline. And so uh, convincing 
our chair that this investment was worth it uh, was very easy because he recognized that in order to make our faculty more diverse, we had to have a more diverse residency. So it started, uh, Gautham gave us a, a lecture. He had a speaker from the diversity, the dean of, uh, our vice dean of diversity, came and talked to us about um, unconscious bias. And we even took a survey and we then had this open discussion about what our biases were. Uh, and it was an incredible experience. Uh, so I wanna highly recommend that if you are on a recruitment team that you consider doing this exercise. Cause a lot of what was revealed was uh, just a lot of self personal knowledge. And it was really important uh, to have that knowledge prior to recruiting. And it was a bonding experience too, because it's a lot to disclose what you are, to, to share your humanness about what your bias about. I was very daunted uh, and I was embarrassed when I found out what mine were. And to be able to hear others and have that open discussion and support one another for that um, was one of the most powerful things that I've been involved in. Uh, so a little bit about my application pool, uh, similar statistics that what you published or you talked about this morning. So about 80% of men uh, apply to my program, about 20, 22% women, uh, strikingly only 12% of underrepresented minorities. You look, you break that down further, 75% of those uh, are Latino and only 25% black. So we offered 108 interviews uh, and we interviewed 42 women. We had 10 Hispanic and five African Americans come and interview with us. So what we did differently this year is we had seven interview days. Uh, two of them were considered our diversity days. And so we published them that way. Uh, we encouraged all of those that were underrepresented minorities to choose those days. Some couldn't, uh, but most of them made that effort. Uh, we emphasize at that, at all of our recruitment that we value all forms of diversity. And we had our faculty, we had two underrepresented faculty interview on that day. And then we brought in the vice dean, uh, again, uh, for uh, minority Affairs to come and speak as to the community in Seattle and how we're supporting. So I think one of the most uh, powerful things that happened, again, this, we've done this twice now, is we had, uh, I had a young woman who came from the South. Um, I want to remind you that the Supreme Court was reviewing affirmative action at the same time that we were interviewing. And she looked at me and she said, I don't understand, why do you care, right? Why do you care? I mean, and I can understand that. I'm about as white as you can be, right? In terms of how I look, how I present myself. And it was one of the most, it, instead, it still sends shivers up my spine to have someone tell me, why, why do you care? And why are you doing this? Um, because all we're seeing right now uh, is people don't care. And uh, I, I just said to her, I, you know, I, and I sent her some New York Times articles afterwards. And so just that pain and just that, um, again, that humanity uh, was very powerful for me. And uh, again, very proud that when I saw the match list, she's coming. Uh, and that's Marissa from UT, University of Texas Galveston. Uh, and so just very direct questions. Uh, and I think there are some lessons to be learned there that they are wanting, uh, they are needing for people to, to express that they are, that we value women and that we value diversity. So I wanna talk a little bit about, I think Carla did such an elegant job this morning in talking about why it's important to have mentors and why in women in radiology, I too have been my whole career has changed based on some of the men and women who have uh, mentored me. So uh, I wanted to, it, Yoshimi, uh, who are, as, as everybody knows is our president-elect, started this program back in 2005. Uh, Tess Chapman, has, uh, since Yoshimi has gone to Utah, sadly, has taken it up. And I just wanna share with you a little bit about that. And uh, it has been a very powerful thing uh, for women in our program. 
So we get together two or three times a year, and we uh, have we talk about subjects that are important to us. So I'm just going to share with you the whole goal is for us to inspire excellence, uh, to talk about those barriers that we feel, uh, especially I have two young kids. Um, I have a husband that has a very active job. That balance at times has been very overwhelming for me. And to be able to go to this group and ask questions, um, and I even, I see Jocelyn in the audience, and I remember a couple years ago just even asking her, I don't know how you do this. How are my kids going to turn out? I was asking her. <laughs> I'm scared. Like, if I'm gone, and then she would assure me, no, my, my kids, turn, my girls, they really respected me. And, and so I think that communication between women, of is it going to be okay? Because there are times when I feel really bad and guilty. Um, and so it's sharing those experiences, those resources, and it can be a very powerful thing. So, and then I got to meet, and I, I know, uh, I see that uh, VJ is here. So we've had some amazing speakers come, and Val came, and VJ, and Ella, and I got to hear women that I so greatly admire. Again, similar to what Carla was speaking this morning, never had a personal uh, interaction, but just um, admired from afar and said, well, if they can do it, uh, maybe I can too. And hearing them speak uh, on leadership challenges and uh, essential skills of leadership and Ella talking about balancing her personal and professional life were really important um, times in my career. Uh, Norm uh, is the only male in the room for about 20 minutes, uh, bless his soul. Uh, he comes in and just talks about how he values women and, and the efforts that he feels as chair needs to be done to get more women in leadership roles and uh, into a professor. Um, we have book clubs, uh, and we discuss the book, uh, Lean In. We had women come over. We, uh, interestingly, I can relate to when I went to be program director, I went, walked into Norm's office and didn't negotiate one thing, not one thing. I just felt blessed that I was being considered. Isn't that, that's kind of crazy. So uh, I needed that negotiation book beforehand, but um, he was very uh, equal, you know, because you find out later, right? We all talk. Um, so I, I did. I asked the other section heads, you know, what, what, what are you getting? Uh, well, how many days and, and what uh, stipend did he give you? Uh, and I was very fortunate that he was very equal, um, but I w really put myself at risk there. So we are teaching the women in our program and medical students and fellows um, that it is okay, that it's important to be negotiating. It's, be, it's really important to be talking about uh, work-life balance. Uh, and Yoshimi does an amazing job. She would put up slides and she'd say, okay, these are the responsibilities of me at my household. And she would say, I mean, it was incredible. She, you know, arranging play dates, uh, meals, you know, just on and on. If we think of all the women, and then she put up Satoshi, right, who is her husband, who is a, an amazing academic radiologist as well and chair now at Utah. And it said, work, 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 takes out the garbage, right? So like this wonderful uh, discrepancy of roles in the household. And, and so again, just these really honest, and I'll be honest, I came home and I'm like, honey, that's you, right? Um, I'm so fortunate that you take out the garbage, but guess what? We're going to talk. We're going to negotiate. <laughs> so I think that in order to have uh, those are really, I, what I'm trying to share was that that knowledge helped me in life and, and uh, really brought, it rose awareness of what I needed to do. And I'm really proud that uh, she started that and we're having some really honest conversations. So in conclusion, I think we need to be, I think what's so value, like I just really appreciate that AUR, that our topic is diversity and that we're raising the issue. And I think that we should all be considering what can we do that can increase the diversity in radiology and increase the number of women um, so that it reflects our patient population. Because when it really comes down to it, we want to improve patient care. We should be talking about how we can increase the diversity in our residency class because, again, they're our future. Uh, and I think now we need to be even having the conversation of how we get them into medical school. How, what do we do in our communities uh, to get them there? So thank you.